Hello, and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. My name is Michael Foley, and I will be hosting uh, this evening with our special guest, Sarah Ann Ward. I wanna point out if you do have questions that come up for you throughout the talk, just put them in the chat. And after Sarah is complete with her presentation, we will revisit some of those questions so we can get those answered if they haven't been already answered. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Sarah Ann Ward. Sarah is a New York City-based photographer director specializing in photographing drinks, food, product, and packaging with a studio in Midtown Manhattan. A Rochester Institute of Technology grad, Sarah is known for her ability to tackle most any technical challenge with often a quirky and conceptual perspective. She has worked closely with brands over the years to help them establish their distinct look and feel by, by bringing them a playful sophistication and modern attitude. When not photographing commission assignments, Sarah is usually collaborating, conceptualizing, and shooting personal projects. So let's please welcome Sarah Ann Ward. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me, SBA. Thanks for the intro, Michael. Um, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, and this presentation throughout the hour is going to be a brief overview of my work, um, what Michael explained, and a timeline of, of how I got there, because it, it, it certainly wasn't overnight. All right, so this uh, first slide um, is a brief overview of my commercial work, because uh, as Michael mentioned, I do commercial, editorial, and personal work when I have time. And this slide kind of is an overview of the range that I do between food, drink, product, uh, CPG work. The top left was some out of home work for Bay Rose, owned by Anheuser Busch. Um, the top middle was for a weight loss company called Calibrate. It's kind of the competitor to Noom and Weight Watchers. Top right, uh, also for Anheuser Busch, but um, Bud Light Seltzer. Bottom left is for Kit Kat. Uh, the next to that was for Honest Tea and uh, Reese's, and then some product work for Tula. Uh, and this is a slide of, of, uh, of my editorial work. And, and some of this stuff I'll go into more detail about the assignments later in the presentation, but the top uh, left uh, is for Cooking Light. The top middle was for the New York Times, an article with uh, Michael Pollan on the war on drugs, which has changed. Um, the right was for a magazine called Clover Living uh, to show the health benefits of eating more fruits and vegetables to your diet. Bottom left is for New York, for New York Times. This article was, or this photo was illustrating an article about the peanut allergy in the United States versus other countries like Israel who, who whose children snack on these this peanut snack called bamba. And the peanut allergy is much less prevalent there than it is in the US. Uh, and the bottom middle was for Bloomberg Magazine when um, Toys R Us was going out of business. Mr. Potato Head was packing up his things and heading out the door to the, the next position. And this is an overview of my personal work. Uh, and I'm kind of finally at a point in my career where the three look like the same photographer. And it wasn't always that way. It was a transitional period. And I'm finally you know, getting hired to do stuff that's really up my alley and stylistically all in sync between commercial, editorial, and personal. Um, this top left image is a, a, a series that I started through the pandemic, just revisiting some old nostalgic toys, My Little Ponies, these are the original line. And this, this image has, happens to be in a gallery right now in California um, in a group show called Pure Unadulterated Joy. And it wasn't intended for that gallery show. The gallery approached me for it. Um, 
and it just happened to work well with their theme. And it's one of uh, four in this series of other My Little Ponies. And the next image, uh, this globe covered in soap was made during the pandemic when everybody was searching for soap and world was in chaos. And the, the title was, you know, if only if that, it was that easy. And the next one over was shot kind of a while ago when I was just getting into cosmetics and, and products and, you know, just seeing so much stuff that was out there and the like kind of playing off of the saying beauty is pain. And this is a nail polish bottle in a toe separator as a guillotine and the cuticle trimmer is beheading it and it's, you know, replicating blood. <laughs> And a lot of my work, uh, my personal work, plays on popular culture and what's going on in the media in like a satirical, humorous way. And this top right image you may have seen in the promotional uh, pieces that SVA sent out. And this is part of an ongoing project, um, which is also in another gallery right now in California, um, titled Dessert Art. And it combines my love for art history um, and college and, and learning about all the masters and the fact that I do food photography. So I recreated um, a lot of famous artwork with a lot of nostalgic dessert and, and desserts and candy. And this is one of um, maybe 10 right now in an ongoing project. The bottom left is um, a Tide Pop. I think like 2017 or 18, it was big in the media that kids were eating these, eating Tide Pops like candy. So I made this one look like a lollipop. Uh, and the bottom middle was made halfway through 2020. Riots were going on in New York, another prime pandemic moment. And this is a time capsule that's a, a titled 2020 and a half. You know, we're halfway there. Who knows what the rest of, um, this year would bring. And the bottom right uh, was a, a promotional piece that my agent sent out around fall. They do some kind of fall promo every year. And it was when I was kind of really working on my dessert art series. So this was kind of like that, you know, an ode to Marguerite, three of his different works, Treachery of Images, Man and Bowler Hat, um, and This is Not an Apple. So a kind of a merge of of, of all of that. And this is my studio uh, in, in Midtown. Um, it's uh, conveniently located in near Penn Station, Port Authority, where a lot of my clients travel in from all over the world for shoots. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet, um, full kitchen, equipped for clients, and, and most crews that I need for my um, video and tabletop work. But if you rewind 15 years, this is what my studio looked like. Um, it was about 400 square feet in Brooklyn in a railroad apartment. Um, I shared it with another RIT graduate, uh, apparently did yoga there. Um, right around the corner was my bed, the kitchen, the bathroom, everything. Um, and about 16, 17 years ago, I was in the same seat that a lot of you guys may be in right now. You're into photography, you know this is what you do, you, you wanna do, you have a passion, but you have no idea what careers there are for this. How do you make a living? Um, I didn't, I certainly didn't know. Um, in my college RIT where I went, uh, offered a New York City trip uh, when I was a senior for all the senior advertising class. And they took us all down to New York City. We were in Rochester, upstate New York. And then we met with magazines, photographers, studios, retouching houses, production companies, kind of anything that our professors had contacts with. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is, this is where I wanna be. I wanna be in New York City. I wanna assist, I wanna digital tech. I, want, I wanna do it all. I wanna move here. So uh, I had the bright idea of, packing up with no health insurance, no job, a few months rent, uh, moved down to New York City, found an apartment. Um, when I got there, I 
wrote, emailed, called, everything I could do to, uh, to photographers that I admired their work, that I wanted to uh, work for, assist in tech. And I, I found these names by going through magazines and resources like Communication Arts, Photo District News, which unfortunately I don't think exists anymore, but just every day I was at Barnes and Noble or uh, magazine store, just seeing who was out there, writing to them, contacting them. And about three months later, I would say, and after living off rice cakes and peanut butter for months, I finally had my foot in the door for with a few photographers. Um, they were hiring me on a regular basis. I was working for any like fashion photographers, travel photographers, anyone I, that I could learn for. I was assisting stylists. Um, it was fun. I, I had a blast and I was totally immersed in the industry. I learned things that I didn't want to do. I, I wanted to do. And I happen to, I want to present this slide um, to show kind of two photographers that made a huge influence on, on my career and, and what I wanted to do. Because like I said, in the beginning of this, uh, my assisting career, I was doing everything. I knew I didn't want to be a fashion photographer, but hey, I'm, I, it paid the bills if I was teching for a fashion photographer. I knew I didn't want to do travel. It was stressful. It was, the hours were terrible. I was up at 4 a.m. for every sunrise and going to bed and cleaning, you know, cameras and loading film. It was definitely what I didn't want to do, but it, I had to learn it somewhere. But these two photographers that I'm presenting, Martin Wonacott on the left and Beth Galton on the right, they were both um, tabletop photographers, which is what I specialize, specialize in now myself. Um, Martin Wonacott, is more drinks and Beth was more food. But when I got in touch with them and met with them at their studios, I was blown away. Their, um, their equipment, their level of production, their lighting, every, as soon as I walked on one of their sets, I was like, wow, these, these people really know what they're doing. And I, and I'm still impressed by them. They still have, they have great careers. And what was even more impressive to me is that being so established and being so well known in the commercial world, doing a lot of uh, food, beverage, pharma, uh, they were still doing their own personal work and they still are now. They were still just very passionate about perfection and taking everything to the next level, as well as being wonderful human beings and, and really showing me a lot how the difference between kind of an amateur and a professional and how they carried on a set. I, I, learned a ton from them. And I feel like if you guys are into tabletop, any kind of food and beverage, you should certainly check out their work. And while I was, in, while I was doing the assisting and digital teching, I, I was also doing my own personal work on the side, sending promos out to magazines with work, most of my work that was still in college or personal stuff that I was doing in my small little studio in, in Crown Heights. Um, and after a few years of sending out promos, I finally had a magazine get in touch for more regular work. Um, and this magazine was Boss Magazine. Uh, and fortunately, it's one of them is still around. I still know the creative director. It's a feminist magazine. They, they do mainly um, portraiture, fashion, the kind of lifestyle shoots, but they had a few still life tabletop sections that they hired me for. And all of these that you see right now were done in that tiny apartment. My radiator, my wall, my desk. These were friends from college, probably a roommate or two here and there. Those were their limbs that I, I had to lean on for resources to make these, these shots happen. Um, in a really small budget on the weekends when I, you know, they knew I was, they knew I was still assisting and I, I would pick up st the stuff that they wanted to feature from their office and take it back to my apartment in Brooklyn. And I shot for them for about three to four years. And during that time, I was working on a, a personal project uh, called Vintage Cocktails. I got a lot of um, inspiration and knowledge assisting Mark Monacott on, on how to photograph drinks and how to treat beverages and 
this was um, during a time when Mad Men was really popular and I was infatuated with the show and the drinking culture and wanting to revisit some of these vintage cocktails. And this, these are some BTS of um, my friend who styles Lauren Penna, who was also kind of transitioning from assisting to shooting. And here we are in, in my 400 square foot railroad apartment making these images. And throughout this project, I, I sent, I made uh, promotional cards to send out to magazines. Um, this is my terribly designed logo at the time, designed by myself. Um, I thought it was great at the time. I sent it out um, to any magazine that I could get contact information that I thought, oh, maybe they need drinks. Maybe they would have a, a drink feature that would, uh, that they would need some kind of photography like this for. And fortunately, about six months later, someone did. <laughs> this was um la cucina italiana uh saw my work got the promos were not completely offended by my terrible design logo um and they they called me up um and mentioned this cocktail shoot that they were featuring some of these italian cocktails that they wanted to shoot in that same style of the vintage cocktails and i was nervous i was scared i was like oh my god i have to rent a studio because I couldn't shoot this in my apartment. I needed a kitchen. There were going to be clients there. Um, and it was, it was, it was challenging because it was anytime, the first time doing anything is, is hard, but I know how to light. I knew how to make these things look good. I was able to hire um, the food styles that I wanted to work with um, to make them look great. And, and fortunately it worked out and they ended up hiring me later down the line after that series for some of their other tabletop stuff, their front of book featuring cutting boards, cheeses, knives, other, other still life stuff that um, was suited for my style. So it worked out. And that happened to be around the same time that I was growing out of that um, apartment studio in Brooklyn and moving into my first studio that was I was not living at which in retrospect I feel like it's so much healthier to not live where you work um and this was the studio it was the the picture that you see at the bottom right in front of the New Yorker was who I shared the studio with um my buddy Steve Geralt is in the middle and his former studio manager and another friend of mine from college, Jen Nolan, who he used to work for. Uh, Steve approached me because he had already had a, a space in this building where you see these pictures are from. And he was kind of outgrowing his space. And he's like, oh, I need to store my equipment somewhere else. I, I would love to get something in the building to store my equipment. And a unit was open on a few floors down from him. So he had the idea, he knew that I was uh, kind of transitioning into shooting and looking for space, affordable space in the city. Um, he knew Jen, his former studio manager on the left was looking for that as well. And, and we got along. Uh, so he approached us with the idea to, if he shares some equipment, which you can see was not very tastefully hidden by that scrim down the bottom middle image. Uh, he stored his equipment there, and, and Jen and I had our first studio. It was for our desks. We had a nice little chandelier at the top left. This maybe was 1,200 square feet. I'm not quite sure, but it did the job. It was, it was my first space. It was not where I was sleeping. And during that time, um, I started this this project that I mentioned briefly earlier that was a part of a lot of the promotional stuff that SVA sent out. Um, and it's another ongoing project of mine. And it got a lot of, titled Dessert Art. And it got a lot of um, online attention and, and press attention. Um, so a lot of, and I got a lot of print sales from this, something that I wasn't really used to doing, doing editorial work at the time. So it was really exciting and, and encouraging to keep 
going with the project. Uh, and the top, the top left, you see uh, a Venus of Willendorf gummy bear, one of the oldest forms of artwork with made out of one of the oldest candies that, um, there is recorded. Uh, we have a Rothko ice cream cake. Uh, that is me, a self-portrait as Cindy Sherman, uh, covered in candy. Um, and then next to that is a Jeff Koons Twinkie dog. And then the bottom row, we have Yayo Kusama cake pops. And then bottom middle is uh, Damien Hirst, but a mix of two of his works, For the Love of God and his dot paintings. And those are candy dots on the skull. So it's kind of a, comp a note to the two of them. And then the bottom right is uh, uh, Pollock uh, Rice Krispie Treats. And a few years later, after getting that studio, which was awesome uh, with Jen and Steve, we were both getting busier, both, it was, it was great. We were realizing that 1200 square feet for two photographers, you know, was getting small. So fortunately our neighbors next to us in that same unit and floor were moving out. Um, and we were like, whoa, wouldn't this be awesome to expand? But whoa, that'll be expensive. Can we afford that? No. So we brought, we, I reached out to another um, buddy of mine that you see in the bottom row picture there, Nick Doors. He went to college with me as well as another amazing tabletop photographer, does more clothing and product stuff, a lot different than my work. Um, but I know he was, you know, about the same point in my career and needing a bigger studio space. So he jumped on the chance to get on, on the lease with us and we expanded the studio. Uh, as you can see is the demo going on the top left and, and the finished, finished product. We we're still storing Steve's stuff in the background pretty unsightly, but we made it work and, and we put in a kitchen, which was great because I could do a lot of my, more of my food and beverage work there. And that went on for a few years. It was, it was great. And I think sharing a studio with other photographers that were starting their career was just such a great support system because we're all new to this. What do we charge? Do you have this equipment? Do you have that? It was, it was a really great experience. And these are still some of my closest friends in the industry. And around that time, um, like I said, we had put a kitchen in. I got called by the New York Times for my first assignment for them. I was beyond excited because they had reached out when I was on vacation um, for something else. And I was so distraught. I was like, oh, I got to turn around. It's, it's the only opportunity that New York Times is ever going to call me. I, I have to get on the next flight back to New York, which most freelancers think. Um, but that's not the way it works. You'll get hired again. You can still take vacation. You can still take time off. Um, and fortunately this assignment came and it was you know, kind of in line with the vintage cocktails I had done, but more to the brighter, poppier world that my personal work was going. So I was really honored and excited to shoot this for them. And I also started around that time getting a lot of a lot of other food work with um, magazines, mainly like Rachel Ray. I was working for them on a monthly basis when they were shooting a ton. Did a lot of covers for them, a lot of food in this bright poppy world. More food work that I was doing. This was like top left for I think Rachel Ray as well. Some of these were for New York Times, uh, Red Book Magazine, Women's Day, a lot of the Hearst publications that, that were shooting a lot of food at the time. And since then though, um, the, a lot of magazines have gone in-house with their studios. The time when I was trans, like shooting editorial, they shot a lot of outside studios, but 
shooting at in-house studio was still a great way to get um, shooting work. It's just a different kind of atmosphere than, than an outside studio. And then a few years later, after sharing that studio with Nick and Jen and Steve, the inevitable happened. We were all getting busy again, too busy to share the space. Um, Jen was actually transitioning from shooting to being an agent and a producer. Um, Steve was going into more motion work and Nick would, it was very busy with his own uh, commercial work and, and studio work himself. So we all kind of went our separate ways. It was very bittersweet, but it worked out for everybody. I, what you see here on this side, this slide is a picture of my very own, well, not shared studio. Uh, it was the first one I got. It was strictly mine. I had to put in the kitchen, do the build out, sign the lease by myself, completely terrified again. Um, but, you know, it, it gets easier over time um, the more you do it. And I stayed in this space for about five years and, until I'm in my current space now. And one of the first jobs that I did in that space was not tabletop work, but more conceptual work. And I was at a point where I was, you know, doing the, the dessert art and things like that. And, and people were noticing that I was doing conceptual stuff, more thought, the more thought involved in it. And Bloomberg started hiring me for a lot of their conceptual uh, stories including this one, even though it wasn't tabletop. It, clearly, it's a, it's a person that um, we made look like the Amex Centurion. This was a article about when American Express or Costco was breaking up with an American Express. They were no longer uh, using their car. You can no longer use their cards at the store. So we made a homeless Amex Centurion. Here's a few uh, behind the scenes, us, a makeup artist painting Joe, the actor. Um, that's me shooting him in the studio. And so shoots with Bloomberg or any kind of weekly publication, it needs to be shot yesterday. So you have very little time to pull it off, but that's the exciting part. That's where you really have to get your mind to work and, and know how to execute fast. And, and that's what I love I loved doing. I love that challenge, that technical challenge. And this, we were lucky for this one because it happened to be like all the stars were aligned. It was around Halloween, it was around Comic-Con and Game of Thrones was big. So we were able to find these outfits really quick. And fortunately, Joe, the actor, um, after this shoot, he had to leave my studio painted in green, but it was Comic-Con. So he fit right in walking out the door. Uh, and Bloomberg started to hire me for a lot of other stuff, and I, I continue to work with them. Uh, they're lovely people. They have great ideas, great stories, and I'm always really honored when they approach me um, for things that are conceptual and technical. And this is one of the technical ones where this was an article about LaCroix sparkling water being in the center spotlight of the sparkling water brands, but that all the other brands were coming up with their own line. And there was, there's a fizz fight, as you can see. And the photo editor approached me with this concept <clears throat> and, but he wasn't quite sure how it would be done. And I put my college skills to use by um, building this insane beer bong situation with assistance of mine. Um, and, and that's how we got that shot uh, in camera. A lot of cleanup, a lot of mess, but also a lot of fun. And these were some other secondary images from that shoot. Uh, bought, uh, the, the left is also ran in the magazine, but not as the cover. Another tower of, uh, of LaCroix falling and the right is, uh, a gift that ran online. It was also around the time when Game of Thrones was huge in the media. And this is that scene of Jon Snow about to go to that battle 
Battle of the Bastards, I believe it was called, but instead Jon Snow is a can of Lacroix. Uh, and this was uh, another one for Bloomberg that was really up my alley and I'll get into more after this about somehow I got, somehow word, word on the street got out that I liked dolls and photographing miniature things, which is true. And Bloomberg gave to me and said, how about we shoot this doll orgy? Are you into it? Um, and I was like, of course, why not? Uh, this was when uh, the Disney, Disney was changed or giving, taking his license, their license from Mattel and giving it to Hasbro. So see, these are all the Hasbro dolls kind of taking advantage, getting a little kinky with the, the Disney princesses. Uh, so that ran on the cover. And that's what I always like about Bloomberg. They're, they're ready to be risky, take chances. They're, they're a lot of fun. Um, this image on the right did not run. It's an outtake and, and that happens a lot. A lot of ideas get killed. This was another option of a little more PG. Uh, I'm glad they didn't go with this one though, but this is the Hulk hand holding all the Disney princesses, Elsa freezing the, the tips of Hulk. Uh, and like I said, I was somehow got, uh, got known as a photographer that likes dolls. And this was another shoot involving them. This was, I would say it's certainly editorial. It ran in, in Cherry Bomb magazine, but it was more of a pitch. Um, and some of the more independent magazines don't necessarily have huge budgets. So they let teams pitch ideas to them for exposure and, and just to get their personal work out there. And this was done with a food stylist, Victoria Granoff. Uh, uh, this and this article is about the 50th year anniversary of the Easy Bake Oven, and we wanted to make this kind of disturbing uh, gender neutral birthday party for the Easy Bake Oven uh, because also if you notice this is the original Easy Bake Oven and it was once blue but over the years somehow became pink and purple, so we wanted to have no gender sh shown in this and make it highly disturbing. And during that time, still shooting a lot of dolls, um, a creative director friend of mine uh, approached me to do this project, which I'm gonna show you. This is a personal project, images of that. Then I'm gonna show you five in a series called 2030 Girls. Um, and this, was brought on by him kind of knowing my style and my thought process and his daughter was playing with these American Girl dolls and I don't know how much you guys know about them but they are dolls that they they count they they've been around for years they come with their bios and histories uh, of what they do and traditionally they're just not very they're not very into science and technology. They're it's teachers, bakers, nothing wrong with those careers. Um, uh, but not very, not, no one into science and technology. So we wanted to create dolls that were in this dystopian world, but also into science, technology, uh, you know, just more evolved careers. Uh, and this is, all these dolls were shot separately and backgrounds placed in. And this was this scene was based on um, House of Cards uh, when Zoe runs to her inev inevitable death in the in that scene. And Valeria's bio was also written by um, a writer friend of ours in the American doll upbeat voice, but very dystopian. So here's her bio. There have been changes since National Media Corps shut down all competition. Now that my kind has to operate underground, information is more valuable than ever. Don't worry, my ocular camera implant is always on the lookout for explosive stories. With my vast network of secret sources, I'll dig deep for the story because truth has no game. And this is Maggie. 
Uh, she is the highest paid Olympic female drone racer. And her bio is, I'm the highest paid female athlete in the Virgo Supercluster. So I know a thing or two about competition. Winning requires discipline and sacrifice. As a biohacker, my whole body is dedicated to drone racing, but being a champion also means being a role model, which is why I started Grinders Give Back, which G with GGBs, the next generation of body mod racers will know the joy of the electromagnetic six cents. Uh, this is Petra. She is a guard for the 1%. And her bio is, the world is a dangerous place and no one knows that more than a private security contractor for the Fortress Manhattan. We have to protect the glass castle so its residents can protect us. Luckily, I always have my trusty TZ-487 and a clear head on my shoulders. When not securing the Riverside Zone or managing the Holland Checkpoint, I'm the captain of my intramural base jumping team. I live for the thrill. But is that so bad? This is Andy. She's part AI and she was based on Ex Machina, uh, that, that movie I think that came about maybe six or seven years ago. And her bio is, I keep my feet on the ground and my head in the cloud because that's what I was made for. Whether it's optimizing electrical configurations or servicing the fire suppression system, I love problem solving. Some say my intelligence is artificial, but there's nothing fake about my desire to help people. It's the least I can do to thank the donors who sacrificed their organs to build me. And this is Dawn. She's a climate change refugee relocator. Um, unfortunately, her career seems to be coming sooner than 2030. And her bio is, when the rains come and the waters rise, it's easy to lose hope. That's why I'm here to lend a helping hand. As a volunteer with the Climate Change Relocation Corps, I know sometimes our toughest challenges are our greatest opportunities. With each evac and resettlement, I meet courageous people just like you. We'll weather the superstorms together. And this project kind of led me to another one that I'll, I'll, I'll get into later, um, very dystopian. I think with what's going on with climate change, I feel like a lot of, of art is reflecting that and hopefully brings change. But back to what actually pays my bills and rent because photographing dolls does not. Um, this is uh, an example of some commercial advertising work, some out of home I, um, banner ads. I think these were digital and print. Um, when, when I get these kind of jobs, this is what my studio looks like, filled with to the max with this product. My neighbors in the, in the studio love me. There's always leftover products. Um, and here is a few behind the scenes, another kind of rigging device we had to build to make the liquid come out properly because there were also gifts and stills were needed. And a little behind the scenes of what the studio looks like. In addition to you know, the print and the, uh, digital ads, I do a lot of packaging, um, a lot of chocolate, uh, a lot of confectionery. I've, uh, I've had Reese's and Hershey's at a, as a client for maybe six, seven years now. They approached me right when they, um, they were switching from illustration to photography. They wanted it, the food to look modern, edible, not fake or CGI, because there was a trend in food photography that went very plasticky, very CGI, but I always brought a, a more realistic sense to it. Uh, so me and the clients, you know, really kicked it off. The, the design did well. So they've continued to hire me for, for years now to, to redo their packaging. And in turn, I also got other work through, through Hershey's. Um, some of this was for packaging and then, so I think all of this is packaging. Um, more chocolate work came from that because once you get known in something in this commercial world, they pigeonhole you, which is a good thing because it's, it, they know the value of experience and, and 
working with the product over years and you know I can light chocolate with my eyes closed now um and I I feel very fortunate to work for these brands I mean if someone told 12 year old Sarah that I'd have a studio full of chocolate and be doing that for a living I, I wouldn't believe them And along with the packaging these days, um, what comes along with being a tabletop photographer and now director, it wasn't a transition that I said, oh, I definitely want to do motion. This is what this is what I want to get into. It was kind of something that that came about in the industry, how things are moving online, the way people advertise and the look and feel that traditional still photographers brought to the table. They started kind of asking us, hey, do you do motion? Do you direct? And I didn't at the time, but I loved learning and I I love lighting this kind of stuff. So I I picked up more continuous lighting and learned how to do more motion, which I'm going to show on this next slide. But this is an example of the stills and gifts for this uh, client, Southern Comfort. Another challenge for this this kind of job is not only do they want these shots to look like they do in a group, they need them to be cut out, like the Coke cut out, the fish um, glass cut out. So you have to light them in a way that that will work and do plates um, for those clients. So it's there's so many levels to some of these jobs that are, so technical skills are, are very important to have if you wanna get into this level of work and to be honest, I didn't learn any of that stuff. Lighting in school, a little bit, but what I learned the most from assisting and, and digital teching. And so here is, I'm gonna play this video that I directed to look like the stills. This is Southern Comfort Whiskey. Smooth, smoky, spicy. Any way you like it. It's time to make your drink comfortably different. And then, like I was saying with the Southern Cover and stuff, there's so many more assets that are required for people to shoot or tabletop photographers to do nowadays. Before it was like, okay, we have ad space, we have we have a print ad we're doing, we have a billboard, we got ad space for it. But it's it's very, very different now. Um, what you're kind of expected to do and the assets you need to be able to produce on a pretty quick uh turnaround and timeline. And this is for a client, a smaller client in Southern Comfort, um, function of beauty. Uh, I do a lot of e-commerce for them. Uh, web ads and to the left here these are long banner ads that were seen on the subway so it's a variety of people and they've i've also done videos for them but i've, I've done it on a smaller scale smaller budget which i want to present to you guys as well you know i had this the client approached me needing all these stills as well as to make this how-to video for this new line and how do we do that you know we video crews, video lighting are a lot more expensive, but we still need stills. We need to do this in a very short timeline. Uh, so the approach, we did it at more of a stop motion look for this video because you could pull stills easily from these videos to satisfy their print ads and kind of get all the assets that they need. And to the right here, it's just kind of the, some of the storyboarding I did with the creative director and, um, instead of hand models, those were all uh, women that worked at the brand. And here I'll show you how this video turned out. I think it's an, important to just kind of show you guys this, that every project, there's a different scale, there's a different budget. It's all different. So being flexible in how you can work and approach a job, I, I feel like is, it's 
it's a good skill to have to continue to work. It's not, not everything is going to be a huge brand. There's going to be small ones and small ones are, are fun to work for as well because they have, everything has their pros and cons. And now I'm going to get into my latest personal project, um, also quite dystopian um, relating to climate change. And what I'm asked to do a lot in the motion video world is, is shoot the end card. The end card when someone is like the Southern Comfort putting down the bottle at the end, if there's a 30 second or 15 second spot of lifestyle and um, models laughing, eating, whatever, they, they don't usually hire that director to shoot the, the end card because it's so product oriented. So they hire someone like me to shoot the end card. So this, this video I'm about to show you is a, a satire on that um, called The End Card. Um, and it's just kind of mocking those traditional scenes in a um, the devastated climate changed world. Uh, and here are some of the behind the scenes for that video. Um, this was not shot at my studio. This was shot at my buddy Steve's studio um, that I shared a studio uh, space with years ago that I mentioned. Uh, he has this amazing space in Brooklyn in, in Industry City where he has robots, motion control, phantom camera. Uh, and I approached him to do this test there. He was all about it. Um, because that's what friends are for. And, and you can see some of these impressive rigs that were built, the fire scene, uh, the cracked earth scene. It was, you know, we did this over two days. It was a lot of fun. I worked with, you know, um, Silas that I work with on commercial jobs. That's my husband as pulling um, it as a hand model. Uh, but I'm, I'm fortunate that I still have the time and, and passion to do this stuff because it's it's really fun and engaging. And um, I love that the people that I work with still are excited to do this on their days off. And that's the end, pun intended. Um, and I guess what I, what I hope you guys get out of this is that... Um, this was, I didn't get to where I am overnight. It, it was a, a process of a lot of work, a lot of late nights, but a lot of other people <laughs> that took risks on me, that photo editors that hired me when I was inexperienced, but they saw something, stylists that would work, do personal work and test with me when I had ideas, um, and then leaning on other people for support and advice. It, the people that are in your class right now and colleagues, that's gonna be, <clears throat> that'll be them for you guys. They may hire you. You may need to borrow equipment from them. You need to run an estimate by them and stuff like that. So I would say if I can tell you guys anything is work hard and be nice to people. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. My pleasure. Yeah, wow. All right. So listen, I have uh, a lot of information there. We, it was like, this is your life, Sarah Ann Ward. It was amazing to see your trajectory and how things started and how you grew as you needed to. Uh, and that was really an interesting thing. It's like, I need more space. So I'm going to get more space rather than going in and taking on this big thing and hoping that you can make it. Um, I, and if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and I will, uh, I will go over them. But I have uh, two and a half questions for you. Uh, many of, because uh, part of it has been answered, and part of it, uh, and one of it, part of it is that you haven't spoken to it yet. So uh, two and a half questions. Uh, the first one is, so it looked like the evolution of the studio became an important thing, and I want to know how important is having that studio, and what does that enable you to do, as opposed to say renting a studio when you needed it, uh, and also with that question. 
uh, working with an agent uh, because that's really how we connect it. Um, and I know that's something that photographers sometimes do, sometimes don't do, sometimes they vacillate back and forth. So I wanted to get a better understanding of that relationship and how it works for you. And then the small half question is, um, all the food and the drinks, you learn so much. Um, and I know Beth, I've worked with Beth before. She's really a great, uh, great talent. Did you do all the styling for the food or do you hire somebody to come in and style that food for you? Those are great questions. There you go. <laughs> really great questions. And the first one in regards to the studio, you don't need a studio to make a living as a photographer and less and less people have studios. But like I said, I think I was just so impressed by Martin and Beth and they're two photographers that have always had their own studio. And I think it really, it also pushes you to have this overhead that you've got to create work. You have to make the rent. Um, and I think that's what did it for me. And I could come in in the middle of the, the night it, or during the pandemic, it was so amazing to have this space that I could just create and do personal work. And I feel like I, I've noticed photographers that have their own spaces do a little more personal work because it's right. It's, you have more resources for you right at your fingertips. Um, but it's a lot of overhead. Um, that's why I suggest doing it um, with people, with other photographers in the beginning, but you don't need that to be successful. Um, I will put that out there because there's plenty of other photographers that do not have studios that do not want the stress or the overhead. Um, but I have so many custom little rigs built and light modifiers that when I'm asked to shoot outside the studio, I hate it. I, I always tell my agents, I'm like, please let them shoot at my studio, please, please. You know, anytime that they're like, oh, we have studio space. And that brings me to like the financial aspect of it too. It's, you know, we still charge commercial clients for it, but I'm able to do smaller things like pitches to magazines if there's no budget for a studio. So it, 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 it is a huge uh, resource when you need it. Um, and I don't, I don't, I can't imagine myself without one right now. I really need that, that, that space to create. Um, I have another personal project just set up now that I'm working on as I'm, you know, as I don't have any commercial jobs lined up and I can leave it set up. I can come back to it. It's, it's really therapeutic for me, I would say. Yeah, like any artist studio, you know, you have a lot of projects that are ongoing that aren't complete. Exactly. And they take time and they were complicated to set up. The last thing you want to do is rush something. Um, yeah. So how about the relationship with the agent? Is that something you always had? Have you, how has that worked for you in general? Um, it's worked out great. Um, as Michael said, he knows my agent, um, Marsha from Palm Reps. Uh, they're wonderful. I've been with them for maybe seven years now. Um, and in the beginning when I was doing editorial, I didn't have one. I was doing it myself. Um, editorial estimates were pretty straightforward. The back in the day, a photo editor would just say, here, this is the day rate for the photographer. This is what we have for studio equipment, make it work. So there wasn't much negotiation and budget and planning. So it was, it was quite easy to do that editorial on your own. But as I got into commercial work, there were so many things I didn't know. I didn't know about usage. I didn't know what to charge for these things for, for just certain certain different clients between packaging and print ads and, and pharma. And, and I just didn't know any of this. And I knew there was a lot, a lot of money out there that the agent could allocate for you. Um, and I've certainly noticed that my agents do that. And I, I, I had one agent before Plum. It just, it didn't really work out. Um, I was a little over eager. I think I was like 26 or 27. They had approached me and I was like, oh my God, this is great. This is so cool. My career is going to take off. I'm set for life. It didn't happen. They didn't get me any work. Um, so after that experience, I kind of went back and just was like, all right, I can do this on my own for a while. Um, and I was agent free for a year or two. And then Plum reached out to me. And I guess the time where you I think as a photographer that you need an agent is when you're too busy to try and reach out to new clients or do your own estimating. And that, that was that time when Plum reached out when I was 
I'm still mainly doing editorial. A few commercial jobs were coming in, but I could, I was getting busy enough that I wanted to hand off that, um, that load to them. And we really clicked. Um, they didn't over promise anything. And I think my previous agent from Plum, they were like, oh, we're going to get you so much work. This is going to be great. It was a little too good to be true. And in retrospect, I realized that was not, it was just not the right fit for me. Um, and so Plum was a lot more honest and a lot more about growth and teamwork and realizing where I am and where I want to be and helping me get there along the way. So it's a really good partnership. Um, and I do think anyone getting into commercial work, I would advise looking into them. But how it works is they kind of reach out to you. That's usually how it goes. They will find you and they will realize that they have clients that they think they can bring to you um, more than the opposite. Uh, because when it comes to commercial work, you're dealing with art buyers and producers that need communication all day long. You could be shooting, but they need to get estimates. They need to ask about talent. They need to just know all these logistics that you just can't do when you're shooting. So I, that's, that's what I realized that I, I certainly need an, an agent for all of the communication and all of the logistics that I just still to this day don't 100% know um, that my agents do. They know that back end of the job and, and it, reading contracts. That was another thing, um, making sure your copyright is protected. Um, and I would suggest that like, you know, before you get an agent, there's, there's resources like uh, Wonderful Machine and A Photo Editor, which is a blog and um, website. He's a, he's a guy, I think his name is Robert something that has run this, this website and blog that that has example estimates and usage and resources open to the public to, to look at. So that answers that. And then in terms of the food, no, I do not style it myself. Um, all that stuff is done with food stylists and a main food stylist that I work with is also represented by Paul. My agency represents stylists as well. Uh, so I do not do that myself. That yeah, is- that, that food looked delicious. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We have a question that just popped in here. Hi, Sarah. I'm a student of MPS Digital Photography this year. I'm really impressed by the tabletop work you have just shown. I'm curious how much retouching work uh, you do on these products and food pictures. Did you hire retouchers or to do these works, especially like the package pictures that you said not using any CG and also that picture of sparkling water cans collapsing? Thank you. That's a great question. That's another thing that I used to, in the beginning, do all myself as well. I was for editorial, I'm kind of a one man show aside from my assistant um, and the stylist, but everything else retouching wise um, is done by, by me. And it's on a very tight turnaround. So there's not much time to do much. So I would say the editorial is very, like very little retouching done on the editorial, but the packaging, there's there's so much done on that. Um, none of it is ever CGI. It's just compositive between we'll take one shot for the bite here, one shot for a break here until the clients are happy. And I, I even if I had the time and wanted to do the retouching and commercial, well, I just never would because there's just there's just so many logistics that goes into it. Uh, before it goes to print, like everyone in the agency has a say in where the crumb moves to the left, the right, around the whole image till it's back where it started. I just, I don't have the patience for that, being involved in that. So I, I hand that off to people that are very skilled in that process and very patient with that process. So the commercial and packaging work definitely retouched, not CGI, um, but uh, retouched by someone else. Great. All right. We had another question pop in here. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Love what you've shared about how your career has evolved and the technical problem solving that is so important to what you do. What is some of the advice you'd give to students to make sure they are focusing on and learning from a technical perspective? Um, I think what you could do, I, I would definitely say if you're wanting to get into this work, reach out to photographers and try and assist for them, even if they need interns or be a fly on the wall somewhere. But 
I would say look at works like you said, um, someone mentioned the LaCroix cans falling, like how would that be executed? Think about it yourself. How would that happen on planet earth with gravity? Um, and I don't have a behind the scenes for that one, but in order to, I can explain that one, that LaCroix tower, in order to get that can right in that spot, um, we put it on a string. So it was hanging there and we knew where it was going every time. Um, so we put the camera on rapid fire and, and threw the can so it would always land in that position. Um, and then that string was retouched out. Yeah, what I, what I love about your problem solving is that it's, it's, it's very, um, it, it has its origins in ver being very analog in that it very physical. You know, rather than you know taking I'm, I'm, nothing wrong with this, but you know taking a picture of something and then popping it in there, but just judging behind from the behind the scenes of that one really wonderful, uh, where uh, it's also from that campaign where all these other water bottles are kind of like you know emptying into that one Lacroix can, and all the funnels and the hoses you had set up to make that a possibility was was really kind of ingenious. It like great problem solving. Um, so, hey, I have another question that came in here. Hi, Sarah, it's nice to hear your experiences and how you grew as a professional photographer. My question is, how do you stay connected with people you had worked with besides being nice to people? Um, Instagram and uh, industry events, going to, you know, the American photography parties, you know, in the before times before COVID, there were a lot of just parties for launches for magazines, um, more social events. And then um, a lot of these creative director friends of mine, especially the Hershey ones and Function and Beauty, since I work with them for 10, 12 hours a day straight for weeks on end, they're at my studio literally right next to me, we're in the office, we've become friends with them. So we go out to dinner, we shoot the shit, um, talk about what's relevant, bounce personal ideas around with each other. I think I eat, live, and breathe this stuff. So it's it's always on my mind. Um, and New York City is a great place to be where you can meet a lot of like-minded people. Um, so I definitely put the effort into reaching out to, you know, my old studio Nick and Steve to have a drink here and there or just meet up at their studios. Um, and I would say, you know, when I went into this industry, we they had things like magazine drop-off days portfolio drop-off days we don't really have that anymore as much that or that i know of but following people on instagram um i think is is you know 10 years ago i would never believe that but that is that's the way to go and, and see what people are doing direct message them reach out um it can't hurt yeah it's great you're because your process the way you are kind of formulating your ideas and technically actually manifesting them involves a lot of people um, yep. and, uh, and time with those people. <laughs> you know, it's not just, you know, in and out. And I would imagine because like, you know, your food stylist and other people in your life uh, professionally, you, you, you know, you work with quite often. Uh, so that, that's a great way to build relationships and, and build, you know, long-term bonds in this, in this industry, which is, can I suppose sometimes seem a little bit isolating um if you're not really connecting to other people in the field absolutely yeah um let's see so we have another question popped up in my chat speaking of social media do you do that yourself or do you have someone doing it for you i do that myself i'm, I'm not very good at it anymore um i used to post a lot more often uh but i do it myself i know a lot of photographers my agents included have social media managers, that's part of their business and marketing, because that's what it is at this point, a marketing platform for creatives. Um, I don't think that's something I would really invest in early. I would just invest in creating work um, first and foremost, because that's, you need good work for people to see. And I think there's so many platforms to see it. I, I feel like that's something in the beginning of photographer can probably handle themselves. But maybe later down the line, I'd think about it. Um, I feel like what I the responses that I get from clients and and prospective clients are we want to see the behind the scenes we want to see how things work uh, how you get from point A to point B because 
you know, a lot of it is is unknown. Um, and I find that it's interesting that this is a digital photography, you know, kind of series when I learned on film. I My first assisting jobs were film. Uh, so I have like, I think Michael pointed out that I, I have that in the back of my ha mind, it has to be done in camera before anything. I know that was a huge tr tangent on your social media thing, um, but the answer is no, I, I don't have anyone else do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, everyone has a different way of working, uh, you know, for sure. Um, and uh, let me see, wait, I lost my train of thought there because I was so interested in what you were saying. <laughs> um, the so for Instagram, do you think, I mean, this is speculation, but do you think because you've been in it for a while now, do you think if you're coming into it now, Instagram might be a bigger tool, uh, a more powerful tool for you as far as, you know, putting your work out there and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully actually getting jobs directly from it? Absolutely. And I feel like it's 100%. That's, that's how people scroll through and find you. And if you get enough of a following... And also read like, again, my, I met most people assisting in digital checking. So you'll meet a stylist or stylist assistant and do a project with them. You guys tag each other. And then, you know, I follow my assistants. I like it. Someone else likes it. It's kind of that snowball effect that I, I do think is effective. Um, and, yeah, and I, I, I think it's a great tool. And, and the, my thought before was that the, the, the mention behind the scenes, and I think, you know, that is so interesting for people to see how things are created and what is, you know, it's like the theater where, you know, you see what's on stage, but there's all this other stuff happening in the wings and backstage. And that stuff really becomes interesting and fascinating, I think. And, and you know, now that I, because your work is, you know, it's very clean. And it's crisp, um, but to then see the behind the scenes and how kind of messy it is, you know, was, you know, made it even more interesting to me. Um, and it got rid of all my assumptions about how you might actually make something like this because everything just seems so seamless and perfect. Um, but it, it it's a lot of a lot of hard work and and liquids and and smoke and and all other things there that that make you know, our, our lives as professional photographers are a little messy sometimes. Absolutely. I buy a lot of kiddie pools and paint tarps to clean up the liquid mess. And a lot of my CCNs have rusted since then to all the liquids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had another question come in. Uh, you had a very natural evolution to motion. Do you see that expanding and being important for most photographers to be able to make motion content? A hundred percent. I I feel like if you don't know how to do it, you're gonna get you're gonna fall behind. Uh, there now almost every commercial job aside from packaging, there's a motion aspect, whether it be a GIF, a cinemagraph, a true motion piece. Just the way you have to see the way that you're advertised too. Um, nowadays, it's not just a print ad. It's not just a billboard. There's so many different ways. Um, and I, you know, was like a little hesitant at first, but getting into it, I, I love lighting. I love, and I love learning the technical aspects. It's, it's all lighting. It's all stuff that you guys can pick up. Um, it's not, again, it didn't have an over, overnight, but that's where my community of photographers came into play. We all kind of shared equipment, um, in the beginning to getting your own stuff and, I, I just think it's super important. Um, so I would get a jump start on it now, um, sooner than later. Yeah, yeah, it definitely seems that way, you know, for because a, a brand has so many ways of communicating, uh, you know, now. And, you know, to hire one person to facilitate all those platforms seems, you know, rather than a one person does this and another artist does that, to get one person that is able to. Uh, you know, answer all the requests that are, that are needed. I think it's, yeah. I think, it, I mean, the vi video and moving picture content is so much more popular uh, now. Right. So it's an important aspect. Um, good. Uh, do we have additional questions? I've come to the end of my question thread here. All right. Any, any last um, sage words of advice for for a uh, very dedicated group of, uh, of photographers and uh, our 
our community at large? Just keep making work. I mean, that's that's the only way to do it. Uh, and it's going to suck in the beginning. Um, but that's part of the process. Uh, you, you, it, none of this stuff happens overnight, but the more you do it, the more comfortable, the more you evolve. And I would just say, try not to copy because that's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, it's It's all been done. So no one's going to hire you to do something you copied. I just try and try and put a little bit of twist on it. I know I like when it comes to food, everyone shot food, but try and do it a different way. I feel like that's really going to get you to stand out. Um, but definitely pull inspiration from people, but take your twist on it and, and just keep making the work. Um, that's how you'll meet people. That's how you'll grow. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarah and Ward, for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. It makes me want to feel like I want to be an assistant. <laughs> Even just <laughs> you sometimes. Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll hold a water bottle or whatever. Uh, yeah, it looks like fun. Looks like fun. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It really was a fascinating conversation. Of course. My pleasure. Good luck to everybody. Um, send me an email or anything if you have any other questions.